Okay. Um, I guess uh, I also have a presentation on just um, my research from 10 years ago. Um, and mostly, again, like this week is all about like, I guess it was meant to be, I guess, cultural stuff. Like, what does culture mean? What does gaming culture mean? What does like the practice around gaming look like? Um, so I'll just do this. I haven't, I gave this presentation last year, I guess, because I taught this class last year, but, um, but I'm using basically slides and everything from 10 years ago. Um, but I've done this so many times now that like, um, you know, I can basically do this in my sleep. Um, oops, wrong button. <laughs> Um, okay, so, and you can tell, like, if you look at the slides, um, it's got a 4-3 aspect ratio, this is before white screens. <laughs> um, but, um, um, all right, so if you remember, I guess, from the first day of class, and I was giving you a little bit of history about me, I went to grad school at UW um, in the College of Education, and, um, I, I originally started off as a master's student learning how to do instructional design better so I could go and work for a science museum or, you know, I was already working at a science museum and I wanted to make games for them better. Um, but then when I was in grad school, it became pretty clear that there were a bunch of people in education who didn't really know what games were about and yet they were receiving a ton of money from um, different government agencies or private institutions that were that were funding research on using games for education. And I felt like a lot of it was misguided because they didn't really understand what gaming was. Um, you know, they were latching on to this idea that games are this like content delivery platform um, rather than games are about processes and socialization and immersing yourself in a community. And so I switched over to a PhD program um, to basically write a dissertation about like what gaming is like, what, what gaming culture is like and, and whether or how education can leverage um, that part of it, the, the awesomeness of gaming, I guess, um, rather than thinking about like game systems and, and gamifying everything. Instead, think about what do games do really well and how can we try to create systems that sort of emulate those things that games do really well, you know? Um, so as my dissertation was on World of Warcraft, I followed a group of players for like 10 months uh, in the game and basically documented their change in practice over those 10 months. Like what, what did they do on the first day versus what did they do 10 months later? How, what, did, what changed about it? How did they basically improve um, you know, and and so it's basically a, a, a study on expertise development. It just happens to be about this online game and about these players who played this online game. But a lot of the things that I found, I think are basically applicable to almost anything. Like um, how does expertise develop, especially team expertise develop um, when people are tasked with trying to do something. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's what this presentation is, basically the presentation that I gave for my dissertation defense um, um, 10 years ago, you know. Um, okay, so anyways, uh, this is the cover of the book that um, there was a chapter in that you all read. Um, the whole book, if you're interested, the whole book is in our folder. Um, I put it in there, um, but of course you can buy it on Amazon. It's like 35 bucks or something like that. I get $2.50 for each copy that's sold. <laughs> which is kind of pitiful. Um, so like, I think in total I've made about $250 or something like that um, for approximately 10 years worth of work, seven, seven years worth of work actually. So yeah, it's not, it's not a good profession to get into if you're thinking of making money. Um, you have to actually love geeking out with people instead. That's why you do it. Um, Anyways, um, so 
can I assume you all know what this game is, or should I cover a really quick intro about it? Is okay. So I, let me ask the question differently. Is there anyone in the class who doesn't actually know how the game works? Because I can probably describe it in like maybe five minutes. I'd actually really like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I actually don't really know what it's about, to be honest. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Yeah. I can. Yeah. I'll just start from the beginning. Um. So. So everything I'm going to talk about is about is about back then. We're talking about classic World of Warcraft pre 2010. So actually more like around 20, 2006. 2006 is, is when I did most of my data collection. So this was like 14 years ago now, right? Um, um, but so uh, it's a massively multiplayer online game. That's what MMOG stands for. Um, those words mean specific things. Um, so massively means that there's um, like thousands and thousands of people playing at the same time. Um, and actually in World of Warcraft's case, it was millions of people playing at the same time. Um, multiplayer online game, you can sort of understand what that means. But but the, the, the important part is the massively part of it. So like in a, in like a, you know, League of Legends or Valorant or whatever, any of these arena games or whatever, you, it's typically like capped out at like maybe maybe 12 people maximum, right? 10 people maximum. Um, for an MMO, each server can support like at least hundreds, possibly thousands of people at the same time. So you're running around the space and, and all, there's a whole bunch of other people there at the same time. Um, and um, you know, so there's there's a lot more emphasis in terms of the technology behind it. There's a lot more emphasis on on really good server technology and 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 um, being able to like handle that load of, of that many people at the same time and everything, doing things to each other and stuff. Right. Um, so back then, I had about six million subscribers, um, which was a huge deal because like the one before it that was big was EverQuest, and I think EverQuest hit about 300,000 subscribers. And when Blizzard came out with World of Warcraft, their goal was like, we hope to be as successful as EverQuest. Um, and they eclipsed EverQuest within like three months or something like that when it came out. And then and then it got into the millions and everyone was just going ape shit over it and everything. Um, um, so it, it became a really big deal and a whole bunch of people started studying it. I actually, one of the things that, one of the reasons why I wrote a dissertation on it is that I started playing the game pretty obsessively. And if I hadn't written a dissertation on it, I think I would have had to drop out of grad school. Um, like that's how obsessed I became with this game and everything. Um, but anyways, so it's like a gen generic fantasy game. These are, those, these are, those are from Torchlight, but um. Um, where you have generic classes, you have like, you know, it's kind of like D&D &D where you have like a fighters and you have, um, you know, mages and you have clerics and stuff like that, right? Um, each of these types of characters play a different sort of role. Um, um, a lot of it's team-based. Um, so, you know, and you have a lot of this sort of like bled into other genres now. So like now when you play Overwatch, you have like, you know, support roles and stuff like that, right? Um, you have DPS roles and you have like tank roles and stuff like that. A lot of that stems from these MMOs um, and a lot of World of Warcraft was based off of EverQuest before it. Um, so you have like, so when I'm talking about like uh, tanks, what I mean is like usually, well, actually I'll describe it a little later. That's what the station is about. Um, but anyways, it's like a, it's a role-playing game, right? So you, so in most role-playing games, you uh, uh, control a character and that character improves over time as you do quests and stuff like that, or missions or whatever you want to call them, or as you kill monsters. Um, whenever you kill a monster, you get to loot its body and it might have magic items that you can use. Um, and so you continually sort of like make your character more and more powerful, either through the collection of that loot or through just like experience. Uh, when you hit a certain number of experience points, then you get to level up. So a lot of this is from D&D. Um, but this is, you know, common in a lot of games, Diablo and stuff like that, right? So, you know, Diablo came out before World of Warcraft. Blizzard was, Blizzard sort of, you know, made their name through, through Diablo and, um, and Warcraft, um, but, um, Starcraft, obviously. Um, so, uh, my dissertation is actually about raiding and, um, 
I was looking at a group of players who actually already sort of hit the end game. So like the game, the game, um, and what I mean by end game is like, um, you, you start out at level one, everyone starts out at level one, you're just sort of running around this world that's like, you know, you know, it has like various monsters and stuff like that, right? Um, and um, you gain levels as you, you know, explore the world and meet, meet people to, who give you quests and stuff like that. But eventually you hit level 60, which back then was the level cap. So like once you hit level 60, you couldn't actually gain more levels. Um, um, and so what became sort of, I guess, one of the common things to do in MMOs is when people hit the level cap, there would have to be what's called end game content or, or stuff that is meant for people who are at the maximum level to participate in, in order to still enjoy playing the game and actually feel like they have something to do rather than, oh, I hit the level cap and I should just stop playing, right? So like, so a lot of these games, and again, most of this is from EverQuest, um, had like these uh, dungeons or um, um, areas within the game that, um, had really, really hard monsters to fight, and you can only actually fight them if you were in a group of a large group of players. Um, and that's different than prior to level 60. A lot of a lot of leveling up, you could actually solo. You didn't actually need to partner up or team up with other people. But once you hit the level cap, the only way to improve your character was by gaining better and better stuff or loot. And the only way to do that was by killing these really hard monsters. And the only way to do that is you have to team up with a whole bunch of other people. So um, that activity is called raiding. Um, and um, you basically join a raid, what's called a raid group. Back then it was 40 people. Um, so 40 of you had to be online at the same time. And you go into this place that typically it would be like three or four hours that you would spend there. Um, together and you would do this weekly or, or twice a week or something like that, right? Um, it's very, very different than today. If, you, if you're a World of Warcraft player today, it's totally different. Like um, the way they set up the game now, it's much e more, it's much easier to do, be able to do this. Although if you play WoW Classic, then it's like this again. But if um, now it's pretty easy to find a group to play with, you don't have to coordinate and stuff. Um, you don't have to find a stable group to play with. You could just sort of uh, spontaneously join a group um, and a lot of times you know you go in for maybe 30 minutes or something like that because everyone sort of has it on farm status or has it on routine um, status um, whereas back then it would be like three hours because uh, it wasn't guaranteed that you were actually going to succeed because um, a lot of times these monsters were um, either new encounters for you or um, or you just hadn't gotten enough uh, enough good gear in order to beat them, in, you know, reliably, and so it would just take a long time. Um, but so when you're in a group, it it becomes super important to figure out who's going to be doing what, and um, and so I basically followed these people around and 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 documented how they figured out who was sort of in charge of doing what, and and then how they communicated that with each other and stuff. Um, so, you know, there's a lot in the, in the, in the book about like leadership and communication practices and, and how you, how there's sort of a hierarchy to how the group worked and stuff like that. And all these sort of specialized chat channels that different sorts of players are using or sorts of classes, I guess we're using. Um, and then the main arguments for the, the for the whole book, um, is basically that expertise is about material arrangement, I guess is about being able to, um, I guess, assemble material and social relationships in order for you to do it, whatever it is that you're, you're trying to do. And, and I argue that this is true of any thing, of any profession, of any, you know, hobby that you get into, the way you become an expert isn't actually what you know but it's, it's what you do. And a lot of what you do is, um, is bundled up with what your surroundings look like and how you sort of arrange your space in order to do what it is that you're doing um, and who you're talking to, you know, what, what, what are your social relationships looking like? Um, because a lot of that learning um, 
journey is about finding people who do the things that you're trying to be doing and then and then sort of emulating them and and learning how learning how to do it and discovering in this case the game was so new um a bunch of people discovering how to do things together developing that together now you know now again it's completely different like if you were to if you were to pick up world of warcraft for the first time there's millions of other people who've done it before you already and so to actually learn how to play the game now is is very different than than what it was back then where no one knew what the hell how the game worked or anything um, um another argument is that trust is needed for efficient group work to to happen for for people to um i guess be able to work uh fluidly <laughs> I'll talk about that more in a second. And a lot of this is like has extended to how I've been designing courses now at UW Bothell is like a lot of the group work that I want you all to do in this class and in my other classes is is like one of the things that I tell people you should just become friends as fast as possible because um, you need to develop trust with each other. Um, and this is a lot of this coming from my dissertation. Um, and then the last the last point of the book um, <laughs> The, the book is actually about like the life and then death of this group that I was with. Because the last chapter is about how they got into a massive flame war and had a, had a crazy meltdown and disbanded um, and trying to figure out or deconstruct why that happened. Um, and my conclusion is it happened because people's motivations changed over that 10 month period where some people's motivations didn't change and other people's motivations did change for how, for why they were playing and there was a mismatch and that sort of bifurcated the group and um um the motivation that changed mostly was that people became more and more familiar with how fights in the game worked and then that sort of and developed tools to help them perform those fights and then that sort of like made people or steered people into caring about how they do in those fights more and more. Um, so then the game became more about performance and efficiency um, than originally, which was let's just hang out with a bunch of people we like. Um, and so the group just sort of completely imploded. Um, but anyways, okay, so expertise, what do I mean by that? So in the game, <laughs> Like, okay, so there's this thing in education called uh, new, new Literacy Studies. Um, it's also known as Multiliteracies. And um, it's basically this, uh, this line of reasoning from literacy studies that you can be literate in a whole bunch of different things. Um, and, and normally when you, when you think of literacy, you think of reading and writing, but um, but what's actually important is that there's a context for that reading and writing and what you're reading and writing in whatever context you're in is what matters. Um, and so then you can become literate in a bunch of different things. Like you can become basketball literate, for example, and you know how the game is played, you know, like what it means when somebody checks somebody else, you know, like, you know, all these things that aren't necessarily written down about the game, but you understand this sort of performative nature of how the game works because you've become literate in it, right? Um, you're able to participate. You're able to read a game as it's happening and stuff, right? Um, this is true of uh, World Warcraft too, right? So like you can, um, as you play, you get, you get sort of, um, you develop a sort of ability to read <laughs> like behind the scenes, how the game works and understand the math of the game and stuff like that, right? This is true of any game. Like if, if you really get into a game, I mean, there are some people who just play a game sort of on autopilot and don't actually try to analyze how the game works and stuff like that. But there are other people who spend a lot of time doing what's called theory crafting and, and trying to dissect how a game works and, and specifically what the math is like behind the game so that they can try to maximize their performance and everything, right? So you can do that in World of Warcraft. Um, a lot of it is done not really by players though, um, or originally there were players who were doing this, but then they created add-ons um, and shared those add-ons or plugins or whatever you want to call them um, 
with other players. And so as a new player to the game, mostly what you do is you just find add-ons and install them and have those add-ons tell you everything and like keep track of the math for you. So this is an example screenshot where I have an add-on that's like showing me a bunch of information in the tooltip. Normally this stuff isn't in the game. Um, the Sinister Strike one where um, there's like, it's giving you, it's telling me like all these percentages and averages and everything. So all that is sort of done by these external tools that people have created um, that you can install into the game. Um, so then this becomes like, okay, so yeah, I guess, you know, you can sort of become like be deemed an expert because you understand the, how the game works. But actually what's really happening here is that I've become an expert because I've been able to identify which add-ons to install, you know? Um, and you only get that understanding by playing a lot um, and, 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 and sort of like, having a self-awareness where you know like where you've identified where your gaps are i need help in able to do this so i need to find an add-on that can help do me that do that for me right um and again a lot of just just culturalization this is this is a screenshot that i used to use to demonstrate what it meant to be literate in the game <laughs> and like and what you should be paying attention to and everything so like um these add-ons that you install, often it's what you actually pay attention to. And um, uh, there's all these bars, right? All these progress bars and everything. Um, all of them are there because I have certain add-ons installed. And that's all I'm paying attention to. The actual 3D visualization of the game space, it doesn't matter anymore. Now I'm actually just looking at the numbers uh, and these progress bars. Um, and a lot of the game is played that way. Um, when when you when you get to this sort of certain level of the game and everything um um you know so there's like there's just you know an example of different sort of literacy skills i guess involved in playing the game um another thing uh in terms of like creating texts i guess around the game um there there's there's a like a para game going on or a meta game going on with with world warcraft and this is true of a whole bunch of games now um, now that we have the web and everything where you can find strategy guides. Um, and so there's this fight um, um, against this person called Ragnaros, which is mostly what the book is about. And here's a strategy guide on how to beat Ragnaros. And it's like 12 pages long or something like that. And um, it's one of the very first strategy guides that was written for World of Warcraft um, for, for a boss fight. Um, and you know, when I shared this, I guess, with education people, like they had no idea, right? Like <laughs> they just thought you just play a game and you, and, you, and you sort of learn how the game works and that's how you get good at it. And then you just sort of like coordinate with other people and you play the same game. And like, they had no idea that there was all this stuff going around around the game or that people were creating tools to help other people in the game, right? Um, there's all this stuff going around, going on with this game. That's just like, it's crazy uh, how much stuff exists out um you know in the world about the game there's a wiki that was created this is with this i think the screenshot is from was this is there a date on here it's probably from 2007 or something like that um this wiki <laughs> like quickly had thousands of pages on it like there's more written about world of warcraft this fake thing than there is for like a lot of uh countries in the in the world um there are some countries that are small enough um, that their web presence is smaller than World of Warcraft's web presence, uh, which I just think is crazy. Um, and all this is like user generated, right? Um, so that's pretty awesome. Um, okay, so the thing the thing that you read, I'm I'm I think I assigned this chapter about communication, um, and uh, basically, you know, each role i guess within the within the group had a specific chat channel that they were using that's what these last ones are um that are colored in yellow and there's some generic sort of chat channels that we are all using at the same time and then we had voice chat going on at the same time um and you know each of us had our screen and everything this is prior to discord like so like discord didn't exist yet so we were using this thing called Teamspeak. um sometimes we use ventrilo um and um streaming like video sharing was not a thing yet back then um and so 
um, now in Discord, you can like you can basically stream your game and other people can see what you're doing. And that helps a ton when you're trying to coordinate with other people. But you can't do that or you couldn't do that 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, right. Um, so a lot of it was just like you had to develop this really good awareness of where other people were in the game just through verbal cues that you were giving each other and, and, and text, texting each other and then just sort of like paying attention to where their avatar characters were on your screen, right? You can, you can, it's not like you could see what they were seeing. Um, but anyways, here's an example of chat. Um, and um, I did this basically to explain to, to um, people in education um, what the talk was like, you know? And there's like this, um, if, you, if you get into literacy studies and stuff, you know, there's like, uh, uh, I guess, traditional disparaging of different dialects and stuff. Um, and I don't know if you know, but like in the 90s or whatever, there was this sort of pushback against what's called ebolics, which like, um, like urban speak and everything. And like, all that's bullshit, you know, all that is, is basically racist bullshit. Um, but like, people develop specialized talk it might not like sound like regular English, but it is still sophisticated and is layered in meanings. Um, for a game, a lot of it is necessarily shorthand. Um, and um, because you don't have very much time in order to type what you're trying to say and everything. So you have to like do, do abbreviations and stuff like that. So like, um, you know, and this is just an example of some of that. Um, so like the big one here, the, the one in purple, um, does somebody, I'm, I'm whispering to somebody, to, to this person in Lori, may I have a hellstone? Um, and like, you know, hellstone's a specific thing. Uh, I'm whispering, Lori is a warlock. You can tell because I'm asking her for a hellstone or only warlocks can make hellstones. And so there's all this stuff like, you would only know if you played the game, um, right? Um, so, you know, anyways, there's that. Um, one of the things I did was I looked at the chat over time. So, so what, what's cool about World of Warcraft is you can have a dump file of all the chat. Um, you can dump it all into an external like TXT file. Um, you can do it now natively. Back then I had to have an add-on that did this for me. Um, and, uh, then I basically have these this really long ass text file that I would export or import uh, into Excel. Um, and then so that each line was a different uh, row in Excel. And then um, I actually used uh, uh, what's called regex, like a text editor with regex to basically parse out the different parts of the line so that I could split it up. So I could see who was saying, who was saying it, when they were saying it, what they actually said, um, which channel they were using when they said it and everything, and, and then take that and export that all into these bar charts. Um, so this is just a visual, visualization of the chat that was happening and like the amount of activity and what types of activity was happening um, at, at a certain points in the game, I guess, or at certain points in the sessions that we were playing. Um, I, I'll just go over this. If you're interested in this, there's a different paper that I wrote about this. Um, um, but okay, so there's trust. Uh, I'm probably gonna I'm gonna skip a lot of the next few slides. Um, um, but one of the things that I thought was significant is that the group that I played with um, mostly played because they, we all liked each other. That's how we started. Um, we were on a role play server, so that that's probably important to say too. Um, so a lot of us were, you know, if you go back to the earlier article we had in the quarter about different play styles or different player types, I guess. A lot of us were socializers. Um, um, you know, <laughs> we were playing this RP game. Um, like there was one of my guild mates, not guild mates, raid mates. So he was in a different guild. He played this character who refused to wear boots or footwear. Like every piece of clothing or item you get can add to your stats, right? So to not wear <laughs> boots is uh, a handicap. Um, but like, we didn't care because he was role playing and he was having fun and stuff. And so like, he never ever 
wore footwear. And I, there's another person who never ran, which is a total pain in the ass. Cause like you have to wait for this person to take forever to get to wherever you're going. But like he never ever ran in the game, which is ridiculous. Um, but anyways, that's, and <laughs> I guess in the case of this group that I was with, it was just kind of crazy. Um, all right, so then a lot of the book, chapter three, which isn't which isn't one of the ones that I asked you to read, is about um, this thing called one of the add-ons that was developed, um, and um, it was called KTM, which stands for Kenko's Threat Meter. It was the very first threat meter in the game. So like, um, um, <laughs> okay, this might take a little while to explain, but basically, when you're fighting a monster. Um, and you have like a bunch of people fighting the same monster, the game has to know who that monster should be attacking somehow. Has to, there's some algorithm for the game to determine who that monster is gonna be attacking back on, right? If the, if the, if the monster doesn't have area of effect, of effect type of damage. Um, and so there's actually um, a way of calculating it that players figured out how Blizzard was doing it. Um, and it's basically called this mechanical threat. And every time you do something in the game, you generate threat, you generate what's called threat. Um, and it's some quantified level. So like, let's say I, I hit you. Um, if I hit you, then it means I'm more threatening to you than, than all my other party mates because they haven't done anything yet. But let's say you're starting to hit me back because I hit you. And then like I have a friend of mine in my group who's starting to heal me. Um, if they heal me, then they're generating threat too because maybe they're actually more threatening even though they're not the one actually hitting you, but they're healing me. So maybe you need to get rid of him first. And so you start attacking him instead of me, right? So there's all this sort of like, you know, basically some way of keeping track of who's doing what and then the game determines which of us is most threatening to the monster and then the monster starts attacking that person um is basically how how the monster ai works um but like all this we have to sort of figure out all the players have to sort of figure out how this worked um whereas today if you were to hop into the game you can just install an add-on or actually a lot of it's built into the game now like it'll just show you um which of your party members has the most threat so you can you can basically concentrate on helping them or whatever but like back then we had to sort of like figure out how this all, all this works so that's what chapter three is about how we figure that out and everything um and i'm gonna skip through all this but here's my <laughs> real quick cartoon about like how a fight works and how threat generation works and all that stuff um and then a misconception that we had but um but anyways the gist of it is, um, you know, we learned how to basically beat this guy named Ragnaros uh, at the very end of this uh, dungeon called Molten Core um, because of the development of these new tools um, and figuring out how fights work and all that stuff. And um, so then these conclusions that like we, you know, we were able to do this because we trusted each other and all that stuff. But then, uh, then the raid group died. <laughs> and spectacularly died i mean this like derailed my dissertation it was kind of crazy because like i wrote i wrote chapter two and i wrote chapter three um and then my raid group died and then i was left with like i don't know how to write about this i don't even know how to think about it because i just made the argument i mean i literally just got published by making the argument that my group was a stable group of players who were able to recover from disruptions because they all trusted each other and liked each other, right? And liked hanging out with each other. And then they died. So I'm like, what the hell, um, right? Does that invalidate all the stuff that I just did? Um, and it probably delayed me a year, honestly. Like I, I thought about this for like a year before being able to write the last chapter of this book um, or the last chapter of my dissertation. My dissertation turned into a book. Um, <laughs> And so it just took me a long time to think about it. And that's another thing, like when you read about um, research and, and uh, PhDs and stuff, um, depending on what field you go into or what research methods you go, you uh, are using, um, there's sort of an estimated amount of time that it'll take you. Um, so like if you go and get a computer science degree, for example, right? Like you're gonna do that. If you get a PhD in computer science, it's gonna take you like three or four years. Um, 
if you get a PhD in, you know, a bunch of other disciplines, it's going to take you maybe four or five years. For me, it took seven years because like I did, I did an anthropology degree, um, which basically means I sat, I collected, I hung out with people for like a year and then I thought about it for a year and then I wrote about it. And that just doesn't happen in other disciplines. Um, but uh, anyways, I don't regret it or anything. <laughs> but, okay, so how did I think about it? Um, I basically realized that so when I looked at, um, so we had like uh, forums, like these web forums, um, discussion boards, like like we're using Slack, right? But back then everyone just used like, you know, PHP BB or whatever. Um, and, you know, every time we had a session, the following day we would talk about like what worked and what didn't work. Um, and so, I, as part of my data collection, I not only, you know, recorded what people were doing in the game, but I also went to these online web forums and, you know, basically took snapshots of, of these websites and everything and used that as part of my data as well. So, so I analyzed you know, what people were talking about and everything and basically, you know, came to the conclusion that um, the reason why the group melted down is um, the main reason is that there was a dispute in what we cared about and um, um, hanging out and hang, having fun wasn't enough anymore for some player, players. Some players really cared about progressing, like getting through the getting through the dungeon and then moving on because it wasn't it was the first basically raid dungeon. There were other ones in the game that were harder and like they were like, well, let's I want to get to this other content, you know. Um, and we weren't progressing fast enough. And so um, there was all this uh, dispute over that. And then, and then we had a loot, loot dispute sort of like, um, like when you kill one of these monsters, um, you have 40 people with you, right? But when you kill one of these monsters, it might drop just five things like a sword and like a chess piece or whatever, and like a bunch of gold and, you know, right? So, so how the hell do you divide up among 40 people, five items, right? You see, you have to, to figure out some sort of loot rule system. And um, mostly my group, like at, when we first started, we didn't give a shit, we didn't care. Um, and then by the end, a bunch of people started really caring. Like, I want that sword, I deserve that sword because, you know, I did most of the work and I need that sword in order to go off into this under dungeon because I need a, you know, I need my character to be more powerful and everything. So we had this like basically um, disagreement on what we cared about. Um, and I make the argument that a lot of the reason why that, why our motivations changed is because of the development of these new tools. Um, so what's funny is that we developed these new tools which allowed us to be able to be successful, but then it also ended up killing us. Um, because, because we had these ways of monitoring ourselves, people actually started paying attention to how we were doing and that's what they started caring about, um, which is just kind of crazy. Um, anyways, yeah, here are my questions. <laughs> Have you ever been with a group of players where it wasn't clear why everyone in the group was playing or was clear that different group members had different motivations and how did it get resolved? And then what extra forms of arrangement or assembly of social material resources do you notice when you play a game? And so social material, I didn't actually explain it, but uh, when I said that you arrange stuff around you and you figure out who you should be talking to and stuff like that, that's what I mean by social material. I think that's it. So yeah. Any questions? That was the best presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> that can't be true. <laughs> it was one of them, definitely, awesome. certainly. That was really cool. What I tried to model for you all is that, and, and you have a disadvantage in this, is that your presentations become better when you know what you're talking about. And that way you don't have to have a script. You don't have to have it all written down. You know what you're talking about. 
and and then you just use the slides to help you remember what you should be talking about at any given moment. Um, it's really hard to do that for articles that you're reading for the very first time, right? But um, when you, um, this is what you're shooting for, I think. It's like, just share something cool with the rest of us. Um, and so that's probably, that's probably, I'm guessing that's why you're commenting that, Joe. Um, I, don't know, I thought it was, well, I just thought it was really interesting in general. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it certainly helps that the content is interesting for a lot of people. <laughs> like yeah. some of my colleagues, you know, you know, had like super dry dissertation topics. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I can't, you know, if I were to present on something else completely, like let's say a comparison between seventh grade math scores when you um, do this one curriculum intervention, right? Which is like what a lot of my peers, that type of stuff, that type of research is that what they were doing? Like, I think, I don't know. I think mine would be just as boring as theirs, so. Um, I mean, I think the challenge would, to, would be like, if you had that topic to make it interesting. Yeah. Well, so the thing is, you should never do. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, you're right. And uh, I'm being unfair, probably. When you are working on your dissertation. I just meant like, if, if you did choose that topic, I feel like something that um, might be a challenge would be like making it interesting. Like if I personally chose it, that would be like my challenge, like make it interesting. Yeah. Most of the time, so this is, unfortunately, this is not always true, but most of the time, the student who is studying or the scholar who is studying a particular thing is actually interested in the thing that they're studying. Um, like when you get to the PhD level and you're, and you're doing a dissertation on it, like hopefully that is true. Unfortunately, it isn't actually always true. I have met, I have met people who like hated their topic and everything, um, but they, they have to push through because they've spent so much time on it. Um, but, you know, ideally you're into the thing that you're studying and so that when you're describing it to other people, you're really, really into it and you're just totally nerding out. So like anything, I guess, theoretically, anything actually could be really interesting, at least interesting for you. And if it's interesting for you, then hopefully your excitement, I guess, is coming through. And so then, then if you're talking to somebody who has any amount of empathy, <laughs> they're actually catching on your excitement and everything and it isn't boring. Um, I feel like people have to be interested in what they're talking about for it to be interesting to anybody else. Because, like, I mean, if you just, like, have a really dry and uninteresting, like, thesis, presentation, whatever, right? It's, like, I mean, how are we supposed to connect to it if you're not even connected to it, right? Like, I feel like people like you can see when someone's interested in something because it's like they make those connections and then they show you like how this connects to you like um I always think about that when I go into presentations like how can I make my presentation connect to the audience and sometimes I fail and then sometimes like you know I su succeed but I, I find that like when I'm interested usually I can find those connections but yeah I think like it's what I really liked about this presentation. It's just like you found all the connections and how it relates to, you know, us and just all of that. It was just so interesting. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So the best the best thing about this whole work about the book and everything is the cover. <laughs> I did yeah, it on an ooh. iPad. It's so good. I like it. Did, did you did you draw it? Yeah, yeah. On, That's a, so on cool. an iPad, on a tablet. That's so cool. I, I like the guy playing on the computer right there in the bottom. Yeah, that's cool. Um, are there actual, you know, questions instead of just praises for me? Because <laughs> I, I don't do this just to get praises from you. <laughs> oh, okay, so... <laughs> why it's important, right? So pretend this isn't about World of Warcraft. Pretend this is about like 
working at Amazon or something, or working at some workplace at um, Thunder Mufflin or something like that, right? So like pretend I'm just talking about how a bunch of people learned teamwork. The things that are important are that they actually enjoy being with each other um, or that they develop trust in, in um, being able to rely on each other to do whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing. So one thing I, I didn't mention actually is, and, it, and after I published the book, I thought about this a little bit more. And I actually think um, when you are in a raid group where um, what's important is progression, and there's a ton of raid groups out there that are like that, um, they're able to perform at a high level because they also trust each other. It's just that their trust is is found through a different way. Instead of trusting each other because, because you're all friends, which is one way, they trust each other because they can see through these tools that each of them is pulling their weight. Um, and so there's like this offloading of trust instead of like, instead of having these, the social capital or like the social connectedness be the, the be the source of trust. Um, um, this sort of surveillance, uh, um, surveillance tools become the source of trust, right? So like in both cases, the groups still work because they can trust each other. It's just that that the location of that trust is different. And I think, when you're in a group and if you're in any group, you want that trust to exist. It sort of doesn't matter where it comes from. My personal preference would be coming from, you know, being friends with people <laughs> um, and like you have each other's backs, right? Um, and that if somebody isn't actually performing, it isn't because they don't have your back. It's just because they just haven't learned how to do it well. And you can help each other in, in, in learning how to do it well, rather than just like ditching them. Um, right. And then, and then, so, so that, that's important. Like, it doesn't matter if it's a game or if it's workplace or whatever, um, or a sports team or whatever. Um, then another thing that's important is again, for teamwork, you need to be able to develop effective ways of communicating with each other and like sort of knowing where you all are at at any given moment. Um, you know, in, in the sort of raid environment, it's like a, 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 a specific thing. It's like playing a soccer game, right? Like the game is where it's super important. After the game's over, like you, you don't really need to keep track of your teammates and all that stuff. But when you're actually doing the thing, that's when you, you need to be able to communicate and, and coordinate really effectively and sort of like know where everyone is and everything. Um, if you extend that out to like schoolwork, you know, when you're working on team projects and stuff like that, it's sort of a slow burn version of this. You kind of need to know like what you all are doing, not a, a, a minute to minute type of thing, but like, you know, <laughs> you can't really like do your thing if you don't know if your teammates are doing their thing, right? So you have to be able to communicate with each other. Um, yeah. I guess those are my main takeaways. So the way that the, this game does it well is that it it divides up the roles. Um, you have these specialized roles, and um, in schoolwork, it's harder to do that. In 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 like the real world, if you go and work out for a design studio, it's easier to do that because then you have like you have certain people who are designers, you have certain people who are like the researchers, you have certain people who are the managers. Right, that's fine. In school, it's hard to do that, to do that strict assigning of roles because theoretically everyone who's taking a class should be getting the same learning goals out of that class. And so if you divide up roles very strictly like that, you can't guarantee that all the students are learning sort of the same basic level of stuff. And so, yeah, it becomes really hard, but figuring out how to, how to specialize at least, or, or have leads for certain parts of whatever it is that you're working on, I think, I think helps um, because then you all can take ownership of certain parts of the thing, you know?
Do you ever go back and play WoW now? And what is it like comparing to that that experience? I tried to. Well, so yes, uh, like two or three years ago, I played Legion when it came out, which is a, a, the, the latest expansion from two or three years ago. Before that, I hadn't played for like maybe five years. Um, and then when I played like five years ago, or whatever, or I guess I guess seven years ago, or whatever. I think that was only for like a year, and before that, I hadn't played for like maybe three or four years or something. So it's like off and on. I'll I'll come back to the game. This game is like I thought it would go away like maybe ten years ago. <laughs> like it's crazy how long this game has lasted, and they just keep adding more and more stuff. But um, I did subscribe last year, like when the pandemic hit. Um, and I was trying to figure out ways of connecting with students and everything. One of the things I wanted to try for one of my other classes is having, instead of meeting up in Zoom, is meeting up in World of Warcraft. Um, so I, I subscribed, I actually got UW to pay for a subscription for me to try that. And um, it didn't work. <laughs> it, I just couldn't get it logistically to work right not everyone has a fast yeah. enough computer yeah not everyone has a fast enough internet connection um um those are the two main things <laughs>